Thumbs Down logos are on vacation this week as we select our top 10 films of 2003. We'll reveal our list and recap our top 10s in their entirety at the end of this special show. I'm Richard Roper. And I'm Roger Ebert. The number 10 movie on my list is In America, Jim Sheridan's heartfelt memory of an Irish-American family that arrives in New York in the 1980s. Number 9 on my list is Whale Rider, one of the best family films of recent years. Set in present-day New Zealand, it tells the story of a 12-year-old Maori girl who would be next in line to lead her tribe if she were not a girl. And number eight on my list is a movie that only played in a few cities, but it's worth looking for on DVD. It's named The Sun, and it's a French film about a carpenter who takes an apprentice, a teenage boy yeah. just released from reform school. Only the carpenter knows a tragic secret about this boy's past. So why does he take him on? Does he want revenge? Or does he want understanding? The movie keeps us in suspense. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. The Sun was directed by the Dardenne brothers, Jean-Pierre and Luc, and it won the Best Actor Award at Cannes for Olivier Gourmet as the carpenter. Instead of limiting its story to a plot, it simply observes these characters very closely as an enormous truth materializes between them. This movie is mesmerizing. You know, it's interesting, each of your three films could be called small films, mm -hmm. but they're actually beautiful, big films filled with fantastic ideas. Yes, yes. Wonderful choices. My number 10 pick is Seabiscuit, a tribute to the American spirit in the first half of the 20th century. Writer-director Gary Ross did a marvelous job of compressing this complex story. Toby Maguire, Chris Cooper, and Jeff Bridges had the outstanding cast. Do you want to see a match race? Yeah! You do? Yeah! You want to see this young fella ride that horse? Yeah! 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 At number nine, I have another dramatization of a real-life American saga, but it couldn't be more different in subject matter and tone. Monster is writer-director Patty Jenkins' heart-stopping interpretation of the brutal life and times of Aileen Warnos, America's first female serial killer. Charlize Theron has turned in some good work in mainstream fare, such as The Italian Job, but she's a revelation here in the title role. It is the performance of the year. And, Roger, your number nine is my number eight, Nikki Caro's engrossing well rider. Keisha Castle Hughes is unforgettable as a sweet but determined young girl who believes gender shouldn't prevent her from trying to become that tribe's next leader. Her efforts to connect with her loving but emotionally distant grandfather are heartbreaking. Do you know what you've done? No. You've broken the tapu of this school. When the Charlie's Angels sequel came out last summer, the actresses kept insisting they made a film that empowered young women, and that's utter nonsense, I'll just say. <laughs> well, Rider is the real girl power movie, one of the real girl power movies of 2003, along with Bend It Like Beckham. Oh, it sure is, you know, and both of those films are able to deal seriously and be good films that engross adults and at the same time entertain kids on every possible level, they are wonderful films. I think Well Rider is the perfect example when people say to me, what movie should I see? I don't, say, I don't care what age you are, I think you'll take away something from this movie. See Well Rider. Right, okay, next on my list at number seven is Oni Mahoney, starring Philip Seymour Hoffman as a Toronto bank clerk who steals millions of dollars and loses them all in the casinos of Atlantic City and Las Vegas. His performance is revealing in the way he shows the tunnel vision of the obsessive gambler who can think of nothing else but the action on the table. John Hurt plays a casino manager who's fascinated by this man's need to lose money. All he cares about is the next hand. He's a beauty. He's a beauty. I love him. I love him. It's pretty clear that sooner or later this guy is going to get caught, but Oni Mahoney isn't a crime story. It's a story of compulsive behavior. Minnie Driver, who plays his fiancée, is also compulsive in a way. While he focuses on winning, oh God, she focuses on marriage, and both of them are blind to reality. My number seven choice is The Station Agent, one of those pitch-perfect slices of life that's reminiscent of the top fiction of uniquely American writers such as Raymond Carver and Larry McMurtry. Peter Dinklage is a dwarf who is painfully aware that his size makes him an instant celebrity of sorts every time he enters a room or someone's life, and that's why he'd prefer to be left alone in the lonely train station He's inherited from his only true friend. What you should do, man, you should get a job on the railroad. You said you weren't going to talk to me if I sat here, Joe. I haven't said anything in like 20 minutes. Nine.
You timed me? Mm -hmm. And that's Bobby Cannavale in one of the most winning performances of the year as the aggressively friendly coffee wagon guy. And the wonderful Patricia Clarkson completes this quirky trio as a seriously fragile divorcee mourning a lost child. Writer-director Tom McCarthy deftly handles this potentially cloying subject matter. It's never cloying, and he delivers a funny, offbeat, insightful film. You know, I was just imagining that some ideal viewer would go out then and see all the movies we've mentioned so far, mm. and they would say, those are good movies. Okay, Russell Crowe, Tim Robbins, and Marcia Gay Harden as the best of 2003 continues. Dennis Arcan revisits the characters from his 1986 gem, The Decline of the American Empire, in this darkly funny and deeply moving ensemble piece. The smug, hedonistic, yuppie academics have mellowed considerably as they reunite to say goodbye to their dying friend Remy, played by Remy Girard. Wu Jing s'en vient en visite culturelle à Montréal, alors l'université en profite pour déléguer son gauchiste de service. J'entre dans la salle à manger de son hôtel, je la vois. Number five on my list is Gus Van Zandt's Elephant. Working with a cast of non-actors, Van Zandt's camera zigzags through a large high school in the hours just before two students launch a Columbine-like shooting spree. I've visited Columbine and I've walked the grounds, but the unsettling truth is that it seemed like any other American high school, and that's the perspective Van Zant brings to Elephant. His film offers no easy answers, no easy explanations or motives, because you know what? They don't exist. You know, this was a good year for the movies. Both of the movies you just mentioned are not on my list, but I gave them both four stars. I think a very strong year. My number six film is Clint Eastwood's Mystic River, in which a tragedy in the present and one in the past are linked in the lives of three childhood friends. When Sean Penn's daughter is murdered, attention focuses on Tim Robbins as a possible suspect. What unforgettable performance. And the number five film on my list is Peter Weir's Master and Commander. It also centers on great acting. Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany play a ship's captain and surgeon in the British Navy in a superb adaptation of the sea story by Patrick O'Brien. The movie isn't just about action, but about personality and psychology and friendship. It's a human story and a grand, sweeping epic. England is under threat of invasion. And though we be on the far side of the world, this ship is our home. This ship is England. Mystic River and Master and Commander both belong to genres, but they transcend them. They have thoughtful and revealing dialogue. They take time for silence, and they absorb us so deeply in their stories. You know, interesting. Uh, Two great movies based on, well, in one case, a series of books mm -hmm. and a Mystic River, the case of uh, Dennis Lehane's novel. Yeah. But the readers of those respective works really love the books mm -hmm. and they're embracing the film. I, I love O'Brien's uh, novels, and uh, what I think they really capture in this film is the nature of that relationship between those two men. It's really impressive work. We continue counting down the best films of 2003 when we come back. On my list is Finding Nemo. The story of a little fish who loses its way and the father who braves a dangerous ocean to find him. The story was cheerfully exciting, but what I liked above all was the visual wonder of the movie. I usually sit toward the back of a theater, but this time I wanted to sit up close so the images could wash over me. Okay, grab shell, dude. Grab me. Ah! Number three on my list is American Splendor, directed by Sherry Springer Berman and Robert Pulcini. The movie was inspired by comic books written by and based on the life of Harvey Picar, a Cleveland file clerk whose everyday adventures got him invited onto The Letterman Show and now make him the star of a movie. Daringly, the film puts actor Paul Giamatti and the real Harvey Picar side by side, allowing us to compare them. How do you cope with loneliness, Harvey? Um, You're right. You do your stick figures so you could plan, plan for your next comic book. Yeah. American Splendor you is challenging and creative in the way it cuts between real people and actors and between real life and animation. It truly captures the doubtful, dubious world of Harvey Picar and his wife Joyce, who is played by Hope Davis, and contains the rich humor of real life of how what happens to a file clerk is as important as what happens to a king especially if you happen to be the file clerk. <laughs> you know, those two choices, again, illustrate what a rich year it was in movies, because two films that use animation of a kind yeah. in such different ways, 
And when you mentioned Finding Nemo, I'm reminded of how much I loved it. And also, you know, it's not going to get a Best Picture nomination because now you have this separate animation category, yeah. which I think is, is, is nice, but in a way, a film like that might have been considered for Best Picture oh, yeah. before. Yeah. Now it's going to win for sure in, in the animated oh, yeah. category. Okay, my number four selection is 21 Grams with Sean Penn, Benicio Del Toro, and Naomi Watts, all delivering memorable performances in this time-shifting jigsaw puzzle from Alejandro Gonzalez in Yuritu. All of their characters are trying desperately to quiet the demons of the past and maintain the tenuous grasp they have on a life of stability and sanity. Now, Del Toro's been pretty quiet since his Oscar for Traffic, but he returns to prime form as a convict struggling to lead a straight life. Stealing ain't worth it. Going to church, reading the Bible, and believing in Jesus, brother, that's your ticket. The jumbled framework will challenge you, but when everything shifts into perspective, the end result is devastating and unforgettable. At number three, I have Sofia Coppola's smart, sad, and lovely Lost in Translation, with Bill Murray giving the most complete performance of his career. He should be remembered come Oscar time. You know, here I'm just one step ahead of you because Lost in Translation is number two on my list. What a perceptive and evocative film this was, showing two strangers far from home, marooned in the middle of the night, able to talk openly about their lives and fears and frustrations. Instead of making this just one more movie romance, writer-director Sofia Coppola really saw these people and the need behind their conversations. Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson are completely in step here. Can you keep a secret? I'm trying to organize a prison break. I'm looking for, like, what, an accomplice. <laughs> We'd have to first get out of this bar then the hotel, then the city, and then the country. Are you in or are you out? I'm in. Murray is a comedian playing a comic uh, actor, and I yet like he does a delicate balancing ball. act. We get the sense his character could be funny, but hey. he's tired and lonely. Hey. And he doesn't want to make the effort, except hey. sometimes, Listen. suddenly. What? So we get a sense of the public persona, sometimes winking from behind the private one. What an observant and truthful movie. Absolutely. At number two, I have the stunning and overpowering Mystic River, Roger had it at number six. This is Clint Eastwood's 24th film as a director, and it's one of his best. Penn stirs up echoes of James Cagney at his very best with his role as Jimmy, a convicted felon who's devastated by the murder of his teenage daughter. 16 years ago, I did a two-year bit for robbery at Deer Island. Is that gonna help you find my daughter's killer? I mean, I'm just asking. Let, let's forget about that. Let's, let's come back. Eastwood has a profound understanding of this neighborhood where old secrets die hard, and he finds room on his canvas for great performances in smaller but pivotal roles from Marcia Gay Harden and Laura Linney, who delivers a speech of Shakespearean impact near the climax of this story. This film is worthy of multiple Oscar nominations. You know, you mentioned Laura Linney, and I'm sure any director thinking of making a film of Macbeth who saw this film would think of her for Lady Macbeth. But the whole film mm. is Shakespearean in the way that all yeah. of these fates play out over the years and finally realize themselves in this present day tragedy. And it's, it's wonderful when the director and the actors are up to oh, such challenging material. What a great film. Coming up next, our picks for the best movie of the year. Best movie of the year, and that would be Monster, starring Charlize Theron and Christina Ricci in the heartbreaking story of a damaged woman who thinks she can find happiness but only creates more misery. What a performance this is by Theron, whose concentration is almost frightening in its intensity. She's a misfit, she doesn't know her way around in the everyday world, and when a young woman becomes her friend, her attempts to build a normal life for them are doomed from the start. Can I, can I buy you that drink? I got my own money. I'll pitch her, whatever she's having. Look at I'm not gay, all right? The movie is based on the true story of Aileen Warnos, America's first female serial killer, a battered child who became a prostitute at 13. Richie's friendship makes her feel like oh, less of an outcast Tuesday. for the first time in her life. You know, I'm going to be hanging out at um, the Moonlight probably around 5. That's about two blocks up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll swing by. No? All right. But Tuesday. trying to enter the straight world turns out to be almost impossible. And I'm trying to clean my life up here, you know, go straight and Christian and all. So if there's anything that you can help me with, I... So you've been convicted of a felony? Yeah, but see, that was because I was... That's not going to even matter, because the best you're going to get is factory work. Hey, you know, I deliberately avoid reading the Internet and looking at trailers to find out about films I'm about to see. I'd rather go in cold. And while I was watching this movie, 
I didn't know it was Charlize Theron. And now that I do, I'm completely uninterested in any details about her makeup or what she did to look like the character because this is not an impersonation. It's more like she's channeling this wounded soul. Warno's committed horrible murders for which she should not be forgiven, but she is the last person to forgive herself. And her anguish in Monster is heartbreaking. It's a great film, and you know, there are Oscar-winning performances literally every year, but certain performances get into that next level. Halle yeah. Berry in Monster's Ball, mm -hmm. I think of uh, De Niro in Raging Bull, and I think Bradley Charlize... Bradley McDormand in Fargo? Yeah, I would agree with that. Anthony Hopkins, Silence of the Land. There are certain ones that come up to you, and you think about them all the time, mm -hmm. and I think Charlize Theron's work oh, here yeah. compares with all the great performances we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. My number one pick for the best movie of the year is Jim Sheridan's In America. This is a film overflowing with sentimental splashes and revelations of deep impact that I never once felt manipulated by the machinery of the plot. The laughs come from moments of recognition where I identified with the characters. The tension springs from a genuine sense of mystery about what is going to happen to these people. And the heartbreak is the result of real empathy for this Irish immigrant family trying to move on after the death of their youngest child. Frankie in heaven. The baby not coming too early or too late. Mom, Dad, Christy, and Ariel, all together in one happy family. Sheridan uses Steven Spielberg's E.T. as a pop cultural touchstone of this movie. The father risks an obscene amount of money trying to win a stuffed E.T. doll for his daughter. And there's another E.T. reference in a late scene I will not reveal. Suffice to say, it's one of the most heartbreaking and yet uplifting moments in recent film history. Almost as devastating as the moment when Sarah Bolger sings the Eagles' Desperado in a school pageant. There's a rainbow above you. You better let somebody love you. Patty Considine and Samantha Morton are magnificent as a couple, still in love but deeply scarred by the loss of their son. Their marriage is tender but also raw and very fragile. Real life sisters Sarah and Emma Bulger are adorable in a matter of fact kind of way. They never play to us. And then there's Jaman Hansu as the mysterious neighbor, his fierce eyes brimming with strength and pain and love he's dying to share. They all bring great humanity and passion to Sheridan's deeply personal story. Yes, they do. And when we reviewed the movie on the show, I talked about that scene between Patty Considine and Jiman Hansu, where everything shifts mm -hmm. in one moment of recognition of an underlying truth that was right there waiting to be seen. And that's yeah. so exciting when that happens in a movie where things are not just spelled out step after step, but where we and the characters suddenly perceive things right. in a very direct and true way. Well, I think that's a rare occurrence in a lot of films because it's a very delicate balancing act. And if it goes wrong, you see the acting or yeah. you're aware of the writing and you just kind of not, you're not into it. But here it's done just beautifully. Coming up next, we recap our full lists. And my list at number 10, Seabiscuit. Number nine, Monster. At number eight, I have Whale Rider. The Station Agent is my number seven pick. At number six, The Barbarian Invasions. Number five, Elephant. At number four, I have 21 Grams. My number three pick is Lost in Translation. Number two, Mystic River. And my pick is the best film of 2003 in America. Okay, now my list of the top 10 films of the year. Number 10, In America. Number nine, Whale Rider. Number eight, The Sun. Number seven, Owning Mahoney. Number six, Mystic River. Number five, Master and Commander. Number four, Finding Nemo. Number three, American Splendor. Number two, Lost in Translation. And number one, Monster. Remember, you can catch up on all our reviews of the big holiday movies at our website, ebertandroper.tv or at movies.com, and read us in print at suntimes.com. And until next week, the balcony is closed. They always say the good movie season starts on September the 1st. And you know, this fall is one great movie after another open. My faith was renewed. It really was. Yeah, I agree with you completely. The most frustrating thing is there's another 10 movies that are just oh, yeah. as good and there's just not enough room for them.